Hey everyone, welcome back and let's write some more neat code today. So today let's solve interleaving string. So in this problem, we're given a list of three strings. Well, not really a list, but we're given three strings, S1, S2, and S3. And we just want to know a simple question. Can we form the string S3 by interleaving the strings S1 and S2? An interleaving string is basically when you take two strings and split them up into, you know, substrings and then you add them together. Now they have a description over here, but I kind of feel like this description actually just made things more complicated for me, like with the absolute value difference being at most one, you know, taking these strings, forming them together. Basically what we're saying is, can we take the string one and string two, split them into substrings. Like you can say, see a uh, string one is split into this one, this one, and this one. And notice how the relative order of these three is maintained. That's very important. And this other string was also split into two portions, this one and this one, and the relative order of the characters was maintained. You can see that this D, B, B, C goes in the front and the A goes at the end. So the relative order is important, but that's it. We can split the strings in any way that we want and then add them together. And we just wanna know doing that, can we form the third string? So the first thing you might notice is, well, if we're taking these strings, splitting them, of course, the total number of characters has to match the total number of characters in string three. And yes, that's true. It will have to match. And in this case, it does. We have 10 characters in the output and each of these strings is five. Five plus five equals 10. So once you kind of understand what an interleaving string actually is, the logic of this problem isn't too complicated, right? For example, we see that the first character in string three is A, right? So for sure we need at least one of the characters from S1 or S2 to start with an A, right? Because we can't just take an A from the middle of one of these strings and then say, okay, we'll put that at the beginning because remember the relative order of each of these strings has to be maintained. So at least one of them has to start with an A and we can see that the first string over here does start with an A. Right, so it's kind of brute force. We're just comparing the first positions of each of the character of the input strings, right? So now we have a D and we can choose between an A and a D in either of the strings, but we're looking for an A in the target string. So we're gonna again pick from the first string and we can cross that out. So now we have a, another sub problem. We have the remaining portion of this and the and the entire portion of this string. Right, so, and we're kind of just brute forcing it. Obviously, if we got to a character such, you know, let's say at this position, we had a Z, but you know, when you look at both of the strings that we have, neither of them have a Z. In that case, it would basically mean it's impossible for us to continue at this point. But what if we had the opposite? What if we had a B over here? And you can see that this position is also a B, right? And let's say uh, we were looking for a B, right? So then which one of these are we gonna take? Are we gonna take the B from string two or the B from string one? That's the backtracking or the brute force portion, right? We could take either of them. So we pretty much have to make a decision in our decision tree that we are gonna choose both. We're gonna see if we do it either of these ways, is it possible for us to take these two strings, interleave them together to build the output string, right? Because maybe one of the ways works, but the other way doesn't. We do have to try both of the ways, but it turns out we can use a dynamic programming technique called caching, where we can eliminate a bunch of repeated work. So therefore the time complexity of the solution can actually be broken down to M times N, where M is the size of one string and N is the size of the other string. And you can actually, instead of doing caching, you can actually do a true dynamic programming solution that will also give you this time complexity. I'll explain a little bit about both of those. So let me just kind of show you what the decision tree for this problem would look like and then how we're actually gonna do the caching. So notice how we're gonna start at the beginning of both of the strings and we're also gonna start at the beginning of the third string, right? We're looking for this character. Can we get it from either of string one or string two, right? So that's kind of how our decision tree is gonna work. We're gonna have one pointer, let's call it I1, which is gonna represent what position we're at in S1. And we're gonna have another pointer, let's call it I2. 
2, it's a little bit messy, but I2 is going to represent the position we're at in string 2. And we're going to have a third pointer over here. Let's call it I3, right? But do you notice that this pointer is always going to be the addition of I1 and I2? If we add these pointers together, we're always going to get this one, right? Because notice how, you know, they're both initially at 0, right? 0 plus 0 is going to equal 0, which is the first one here. If we increment one of them, right, if we take this pointer and shift it over here, this is going to be 1. So we're going to take 1 plus 0, add it together, and we're going to get at the position 1, which is going to be over here. And that makes sense because if we use a character from here, that's going to take up the character that's over here. So that's kind of how the math works out. So in reality, we just have to keep track of two pointers. The third pointer can be calculated for the position of this string. So we start at the position 0, 0. The first 0 indicates what position we're at over here. Second pointer indicates where we're at over here. And we're going to compare. So does this equal this character? Of course it does, right? D does not equal A, but A equals A. So we can uh, shift our pointer over here and shift our pointer over here. So in this case, we didn't have to make two decisions. We just had an easy job. We just had to make one decision. So let's call that uh, one zero because we shifted our first pointer to the position one. And now I'm going to go kind of fast because I think you probably get what we're going to do. So once again, this is the character that matches in string three. So we can shift both of our pointers to the next position. And once again, we incremented the first pointer. So we're going to be at two zero. And in this case, B does not match D, but this character does. So once again, let's shift our pointers by one. And in this case, we shifted the second pointer, so let's call that 2, 1. I don't really know why I'm drawing the decision tree like this, but let's continue. So in this case, you can see we're looking for a B, and we can get a B from this one or from this one, right? So that's going to be two different decisions. We finally have two different decisions. We can either do 3, 1, or we can do 2, two depending on how we do it so this is kind of where the complexity is going to come right and the worst case would be that we could make two decisions every single time so you can see that if we continue drawing this out the worst case time complexity for a particular uh, decision tree could be two to the power of n plus m basically the total number of characters that we have but you can see that we might be repeating the same sub problem multiple times Right, how many different possible pairs of values could we even have like this? Well, we could only have n different values in the first position. We could have m different values in the second position. That's where the time complexity n by m comes from. So we can do this by caching. I'm going to show you how we can do that in the coding portion. So this will make sure that we have this many sub problems. And if we repeat the same sub problem, we can just do it in O of one time because we're going to be caching the result of that. Now, what exactly is the value that we're going to be caching? Well, for any particular sub problem, like for either of these branches, we want to know ultimately from here, are we actually able to form the remaining portion of the result string? So either it's going to be true or false, right? We're not storing a value like a number or anything. We're going to be storing true or false for any of these. And actually, if we find a single true, then we don't have to cache it because if we find a single true, that means we are able to form the result string and then we can immediately return true by going back up to the root that we called this recursive function from. So we discussed the memoization solution, but let's go over the true dynamic programming solution, which is going to be pretty similar to what we just talked about. So just to quickly go over, what was the base case in our recursive solution that we went over? Well, what what would happen if, let's say, the, the last uh, pointer in the first string reached this position out of bounds and the pointer of string two reached this position? That would mean if we added them together, we would get to the out of bounds position in S3, right? So basically... If both of the pointers become out of bound, that's how you know we have reached the base case. And in that case, that means we built the resulting string and we can return true. So when we go over to the dynamic programming solution, take a look at this grid that I've drawn. You might recognize this as a regular dynamic programming grid. This is string one. This is string two. We multiplied them together because remember it's M by N. That's what our a cache is going to look like. So I'm basically drawing what the cache looks like. But you can see that this is the dimensions, but I have one extra layer out here, which is important in this problem. Remember what I just said? If this if we're out of bounds in this string and we're out of bounds in this string, that's going to lead us to this position. So that's our base case. We want to initialize this with a T for true. 
and a particular value in this grid, for example, this one, means that let's say we had this remaining portion of the string and we had this remaining portion of the string, you can see that both of these together form a uh, form two different characters right two characters in total so what we're asking is if you look at the last two characters in our resulting string we want to know can these two characters a and c form this string a c right that's the target string that we're looking for can these two characters form it of course by looking at them you can tell yes they can form this string right but that's basically what we're going to be computing. We're going to be doing that for every single cell in this 2D grid. And yes, we're even going to have to calculate these out of bounds positions. Why is it that we have to do that? Because they're actually valid positions. Take a look at this position. This means that if we had zero characters from string one, but we had a single character from string two, meaning, you know, the character A, can we form the last character of the target string? Well, the last character on the target string is C. This character is a so therefore we can't do that right so we have to put a false over here and similarly from this position we're looking at just these last two characters c a using these characters can we form the target string a c you might think yes but no we can't because remember the relative order of these characters has to match this first character c has to match this character but it doesn't so this is also going to be a false Right, and of course we would do the same thing for this position, right? Computing this if we had a C from here, but we had nothing from here. In that case, this is actually gonna be a true because we have uh, a value here. For an arbitrary position like this, let me just show you what's gonna happen. Uh, obviously this, mat this is uh, a B here, and we have a B in this portion as well. So if we take the indices of these, which is two plus two, we get to index four in our target string, which is this target character, right? We're looking for a B. Now notice how either of these can get there. If we used the B from th uh, this position, like this B, what would we do in that case? Well, then we'd want to know, okay, we w if we were able to get a B, now does the result in the bottom position equal true? Why are we looking in the bottom position? Because we just used this B, so we can't use it again. We have to use these last two characters, but we can use this first B if we want to because we didn't use it yet. So in that case, we would go down. In the opposite case, if we used this B, we cross it out. We can still use this one, but we can only use two characters from here. So in that case, we would go to the right now if either of these in this case we can go in both directions if either the bottom neighbor is true or the right neighbor is true then we can put true in this position if they were both false then we can't put false if only then we can't put true if only one of them was true then we can also put true now let's dive into the coding portion. So in the interest of time, I'm just gonna skip and show you what the memoization recursive solution looks like, and then we're gonna code up the dynamic programming solution. So we do have a cache. In this case, it's gonna be a hash map, and you can see we're passing in two pointers into our function, just like we did in the drawing, right? And our base case is yes, if i and j are out of bounds, then we can return true. That's one base case. Another base case is if this position has already been computed, meaning it's all already in the dynamic programming cache, then we can just return the result. Now, if that's not the case, then we have to go into our recursive case. You might not be able to tell, but yes, this is recursion because we're checking if i is still in bounds, right? Because technically one of the strings could be out of bounds. So if i is in bounds, then we're gonna check, does the character in string one, i basically is the pointer for string one, does that character match the target position we're looking at in string three, like I said, we're taking I plus J, the two pointers, adding them together to find the target character in string three. So if the characters match, then we're going to take I and increment it by one, right? We're incrementing it by one because we're saying we just used the character from string one. Now, the next two lines of code are the exact opposite. If the string, if the character, if the pointer in string two is in bounds and that character in string two matches the target character, then we're going to take DFS and increment J by one saying we just used the character in string two and if that returns true then we can return true in either of these cases we don't have to cache that because if we find one valid result then we can immediately return true from the root function if neither of them return true then we have to dp cache this as false and then return false because we don't want to have to repeat the work again so that's the entire function i bet it's a little bit easier than you expected and then all we have to do is call dfs starting at the beginning of both strings zero zero 
So now let's do the DP portion. And the first thing I'm gonna do is just make sure that the length of the strings add up to the length of the target string. So if length of string two and string three add up to the length of string one, then we can return uh, false if they don't add up. Let me make that correction. If they don't add up, then we return false. Otherwise we can continue. So otherwise we can actually uh, basically, so otherwise we can initialize our DP two dimensional array. I'm just gonna copy paste that in the interest of time. So remember, we're just gonna initialize this as basically empty. In other words, we're gonna initialize everything as false and the dimensions are gonna be basically the length of string one and string two plus one. Remember, because we do need that outside layer. So that's just what this is doing. You could do this differently in other languages. And for the out of bounds position, like the out of bounds position in both strings, string one and string two, we want to initialize that corner value as true. Remember, just like in the drawing position, uh, the drawing picture. And I don't know if I mentioned this in the drawing, but we are gonna start at the bottom right corner and then work our way to the left and then work our way up row by row. So that's what these two are, uh, these two for loops are indicating. It's a nested loop. We're starting at the bottom right, working our way to the top left. Now the rest of this code is actually gonna be very much borrowed from what we just did in the recursive solution. So I'm actually just gonna copy and paste these two lines to show you it's actually very similar to the recursive solution. So what exactly do we need to change? The same thing is true if I is in bounds, because remember one of these strings could be, one of these pointers could be out of bounds because we are uh, computing some of those out of bound corner positions, right? So if I is still in bounds, then we want to check, okay, does that character equal to the target character we're looking for? If it does, we don't want to compute DFS, right? But we want to know if the result of this is true, but we can do that from our DP, right? We're not doing recursion. We're just using our DP value. And since we're computing this bottom up, we know that the result of this will already be computed. So instead of saying DFS, let's change this to DP of I plus one and J. So if this happens to be true, then what are we gonna do? We're not gonna return true, right? Because we're not doing this recursively. We're gonna set DP of I and J, whatever we're currently at in this for loop, and then set it equal to true, right? Again, for these bottom two lines, we're gonna do the exact same. So instead of calling DFS, if J is still in bounds and the character at J equals the character we're looking for, we're not gonna call DFS. We want to know is DP of these two pointers still uh, true. So we're going to say I, DP of I, and DP of J plus one. If that's true, then we can set our DP position to true. It's possible that both of these if statements will execute. That isn't a problem for us, right? We'll set it to true either way. Now, if neither of these if statements executes, we want to set our DP position equal to false, but notice how we already initialized the entire 2D grid to false, right? So we actually don't need to do that third condition. And I know I kind of pretty much just cheated by copy and pasting a bunch of this, but that's the entire code. I'm not kidding. So once you do that uh, nested for loop, we can just return the result of DP at position zero, zero. That's the entire code. So yes, the solution works. It's efficient. And we just, and I just showed you how to solve it in two different ways. So I hope this was helpful. If it was, please like, and subscribe. It supports the channel a lot and I'll hopefully see you pretty soon. Thanks for watching.